Hello, welcome to Camden, Arkansas First United Methodist Church Sunday School class. And I'm Ellen Horseman. We're moving right along here in the book we've been looking at by Reverend Scott Sauls called Irresistible Faith, Becoming the Kind of Christian the World Can't Resist. And he's gotten into the third section, which has to do with ourselves being an irresistible Christian. Before he begins his chapter seven, he quotes from a person who talks about the fact that if we want to see a church that has a, a pouring out of faith, if we want to see a church that has a what we might call a revival, uh, where people are spirit filled and where they're and where they're sharing that with, with Christ, this person says this will only happen as and when local congregations renounce an introverted concern for their own life and recognize that they exist for the sake of those who are not members. As a sign, instrument, and foretaste of God's redeeming grace for the whole life of society. And so we come to chapter 7. So I said chapter 7, which is called Treasuring the Poor. Uh, to get that started, let me read to you a couple of things from Matthew chapter 7. Uh, I'll start with verse 21 to 23. And in this, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of the Father who is in heaven will enter. On the judgment day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and expel demons in your name and do lots of miracles in your names? And then I will tell them, I've never known you. Get away from me, you people who do wrong. Now, that sounds like people that never called themselves Christians, but did you notice that, that Jesus was talking about people who have prophesied in his name and expelled demons in his names? And here's another one. Uh, of course, we're familiar with Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus tells the good ones, the, the sheep, isn't it? Uh, you, you fed me and you clothed me and so forth. And they say, well, we, we do that. When you did that for the least of my people, you did it for me. And I have, I think with a lot of times, we always want to think that that's who we are. We're the ones that are feeding and clothing and so forth. But listen to the rest of the words there in Matthew uh, 25. We'll start with verse 41. And then he'll say to those on his left, get away from me. You will receive terrible things. Go into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you didn't give me food. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger. You didn't welcome me. I was naked. You didn't give me clothing to wear. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And they will reply, but Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and, and didn't do anything to help you? And then he will answer, I assure you that when you haven't done it for me, uh, I'm sorry, when you haven't done it for one of the least of these, you haven't done it for me. Let me read that last word, sentence again since I bundled it. I messed it up. <laughs> then he will answer, I assure you, that when you haven't done it for one of the least of these, you haven't done it for me. Do these words disturb us? I, I don't think that they always do because I, I think we always assume uh, that we're the good guys in that story. But of course we've done these things for Jesus. But here's what Reverend Souls says, and I think he has a good point. So I'm going to read to you from his page 122, if I can find my way there. Uh, wait a minute, 122. Oh, I got to put this on pause a minute. Excuse me. So you were on pause. Did you miss me? I put the paper clip in the wrong place. Here's what Reverend Saul says, that the, these words that I read, you should jolt us, he says, especially because they will be spoken to church folk. People who spent their lives attending church and reading their Bibles and giving their money and praying their prayers and getting their theology right and, well, maybe even preaching sermons and writing Christian books. And yet, like the ancient church at Laodicea, though they have built reputations for being spiritually alive, Jesus will expose them as naked, poor, wretched, and blind. Oh, okay. So what are we learning from this? I think that it tells us that we need to take a hard look at ourselves and make sure that we are caring for the poor. 
And for the, the strangers, uh, another word for that in the Bible is immigrants, the poor, the immigrant, the sick, those who are in prison, this is down and out, you might say. Friends, we can't separate our life of faith from caring for and caring about the poor and others in need. You know, genuine faith simply cannot exist without a genuine love for our neighbors and especially for the poor. First uh, John 3, 16 through 18 puts it this way. This is how we know that we love. This is how we know love. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if someone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but refuses to help, how can the love of God dwell in a person like that? Little children, let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. So the love that Jesus calls us to, friends, it means that we must help the poor. We must love the poor. We must care about the poor. When we get too comfortable and we forget this call, then we're missing out on the heart of the gospel. Reverend Saul cites, uh, I think he said it was a predecessor of his in the church where he pastors, a Reverend Dr. Charles McGowan. And McGowan said that, that our doctrine, now think about our doctrine, it's what we believe. Uh, it's those truths that we hold dear about our Christian faith. He said our doctrine, what we believe about God and the world then, that that is only the skeleton of our faith. You know, as a human, we can't exist with only a skeleton. And, and that's the way it is as Christians to be alive, to be a, a irresistible Christians. We need a faith that pours forth in loving and caring for our neighbors. We can't just be doctrine. We have to be loved. We need a heart and we need a hand for the poor. Reverend Sauls says that essentially Jesus says to the doctrinally sound, church-going, comfort-seeking religious folk who disregard the poor, doing church things and being religious and reading your Bible every day and saying your prayers does not make you a disciple of Jesus. We have to love as he loved us. Now, are you feeling despairing as I, as I talk about these things? Are you not sure that you care enough about the poor? Well, Reverend Sauls reminds us that it's never too late. It's never too late for those of us whose faith has, has been, or sometimes is, too much skeleton uh, of doctrine and nothing else. He says it's never too late, Reverend Saul says, because God loves bringing dead bones to life with living flesh and because God's mercies are new every morning. He goes on to say, if salvation can come to the house of formerly self-serving, greed-driven, poor exploiting Zac Zacchaeus, then salvation can come to our house too. Jesus Christ can work this miracle of love in us. And, and Reverend Sauls, I thought, had an interesting take. He said, when we look at the many warnings that Jesus gives us about caring for the poor and for the down and the outs uh, of society, we could see that as chastisement, but really they are mercies, he said. Jesus is being merciful for us. He's calling us to remember God's love and mercy. He's teaching us how to love our neighbors as ourselves. He's teaching us a way of life that brings our dead bones alive in God and in Christ Jesus. In Jesus Christ himself, friends, we see the model of caring for the poor. And I want to start by saying this. I want you to think about this. God, the creator of the universe, chose to become incarnate, to take on human flesh. And when God did that, God came as was born into a poor family and remained a poor person all of his life. Jesus was born poor and Jesus was poor. As a matter of fact, in one place in Luke's gospel, Jesus says that the son of man has no place to lay his head. So he's poor and he's homeless. And so to me, that, that choice that God made 
in that incarnation tells us a lot about God's love for the poor. And then look at how Jesus launches his ministry. He goes into the uh, the the synagogue and he's given the scroll from Isaiah and he turns in it. He knows right where to turn and he reads these words from Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus adds, today the scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. So Jesus is announcing that his mission, his passion is to, is to bring good news to the poor and release to the prisoners. In other words, Jesus says his very mission is to go to those people that are the down and outs, the ones that society tends to look down on. And of course, look at his life. Jesus regularly associates with the poor, with the sinners, with the outcast, with the lepers, with all the people that us middle-class folks don't want to be around. And, you know, the early church also was very intentional about caring for the poor and for each other. Uh, Reverend Sauls says that their generosity was so profound and so public that, as the book of Acts puts it, they had favor with all the people, including their unbelieving neighbors. And Reverend Sauls also cites a wonderful report that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians when he talks about the generosity of the Macedonian church. So let me find it here in Reverend Saul's book. So he's going to be quoting from Paul. Uh, let's see, let me get it here now. Here we go. So we're going to start first from Paul, and then we'll add something that Reverend Saul says. So here's Paul talking. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their, their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. So I'm, I'm throwing Ellen in here before I read Reverend Saul's. They, they begged for the favor, they said, of being able to give, even though they themselves were poor. Let me read Reverend Saul's. He said, did you catch, catch that? The Macedonians, who had fallen on hard times themselves, begged Paul and the other apostles for an opportunity to help provide relief for others who, like them, were suffering from economic scarcity. Sometimes the people with the most generous hearts are those who themselves live in scarcity, perhaps because in their scarcity, they are more sensitive to the reality that all of life is a gift from God and that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So uh, if, if we know that we're supposed to be generous and loving and to care for the poor, what holds us back? What holds us back? Maybe nothing holds you back, but I have to admit, uh, though I sometimes get involved in caring for the poor, sometimes I hold back when I shouldn't. Well, what holds us back? Well, sometimes, honestly, if we take a good look around us and we see the poor, we can be overwhelmed by the amount of poverty and suffering that we see. And we think, what can I do about that? But we're not called to fix every single thing only to minister where we are and where we can. You know, and uh, I think sometimes I talked about uh, seeing that sometimes we don't see the poor. And why? I don't know. We get in our own little shell, our own little cocoon, and then we just don't see the people who are poor. I'm thinking one time uh, at Ozark Mission Project, we, we had a policy that you had to call on everyone. And so I went to a house and made a call because it looked like the people were asking for help with electricity and things that, that the Ozark Mission Project kids were not able to do. And when I got there, oh my goodness, this house, uh, it, was, it was an old trailer and it was just a wreck. The yard was full of holes. The kids were dirty. The mother was all skinny and <laughs> to me she looked wormy. 
uh, her mother, who also lived with her, was, uh, you know, had no teeth. They, their clothes were dirty. They were obviously very poor, but they were very, very sweet ladies. We couldn't help them, but we were able to find some folks who could help them with their needs, which had to do with electrical wiring. But I remember when I got in my car thinking to myself as I drove off after spending some wonderful moments with these women, would I even have seen these women if I hadn't had to come here for OMP? Would I have driven by their house and not even noticed how poor they were? Or worse yet, would I have looked at them and tsk tsk? how can people live that way? We do that sometimes, which I guess gets me to another one of the reasons why we sometimes don't help the poor. We have a tendency sometimes to, uh, well, Reverend Saul says to have a dismissive attitude towards the poor. Ellen calls it a judgmental attitude towards the poor. We have a tendency, at least in the back of our mind, if not consciously, to think that if they're poor, it's their own fault. We're like the disciples saying to Jesus in the Gospel of John, they look at that blind man and they say, Lord, whose fault was it that he was born blind? Was it his parents or his? But they assume, you know, guy's blind, there must have been some sin. And we do that sometimes with the poor. We think that they, you know, it's their own fault if they're poor. And, and if they weren't lazy or if they weren't dope dealers or, you know, if they just pull themselves up by their bootstraps like the rest of us do, I've always worked hard for what I get. We, we want to apply judgments to the poor. We don't think about the fact that there are whole systems in place that, that keep people poor. Uh, or, uh, you know, we don't think about what we were born into. I mean, was I born into a family that didn't have enough food to eat? Was I born into uh, a slum? Uh, was I born into a war zone? Did I, uh, did I have to try to escape with my family and go to another country so that I could, so that I could feed my children? We, we don't think sometimes. We just want to condemn the poor. We want to think it's their own fault. And I think when we think like that, we, we're missing out on, on uh, what Jesus has taught us to do. But let me put it another way to you. Reverend Saul says, I'm going to quote him now, to condemn the poor is to condemn Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was poor. Hmm. To condemn the poor is to condemn Jesus. And what's more, Jesus tells us when you give food to a person who's hungry, when you uh, take care of someone who's a, an immigrant or stranger, when you visit the sick, et cetera, et cetera, you are doing that for me. So when we condemn the poor, we are condemning Jesus. Also, I think we should remember Jesus said to us, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. He gave us, if, if we have things, including wealth, then we're required to share that. But, you know, perhaps what we really need is we need to recognize the humanity of the poor. These are people that care about their children, that they, they love their spouses, they quarrel with people, all the same things that we do. You know, very often the poor are the most generous people. We've talked about that with the Church of Macedonia, but I've seen that myself in person that poor people very often are much more willing to help others, are much more generous. You know, so what if we saw the poor, Reverend Saul says, what if we saw the poor as, as people who can help us? What if we saw serving the poor as an opportunity? The poor can be great teachers about what really matters in life. When I think about how often the working with Ozark Mission Project, especially, I've seen campers who were in awe of some of their very poor neighbors that they went to visit because they'd be looking around and here would be some people that had absolutely nothing and they would be uh, so grateful 
uh, when when you had prayer time and devotion, these people would be set, would be talking about how good God is and how generous God is and how God has blessed them. And my little campers, you know, that were feeling sorry for themselves because they were sleeping in a church and they didn't have their house with the four bathrooms or whatever it might be, they they realized how happy these poor people were. And they were amazed at their generosity and they learned from them that what's really important is the God of love. The faith of the poor helps us to realize that our true riches are found not in the things that we own, but in the love of God. <laughs> Whereas Reverend Saul puts it, he says there's the math that, that his church does. They say everything minus Jesus equals nothing. So you can have everything in the world, but if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. But that, but they also, their other equation is nothing plus Jesus equals everything. When Jesus calls us, friends, to care for the poor, he is inviting us into a way of life that is rich beyond anything the world can measure. He's inviting us to participate in his love and his grace, just as Jesus loved us and gave us grace and forgave us when we don't deserve it. We can love other people. So what if there's a poor person who, quote, doesn't deserve our help? So what if that person got himself or herself in that situation? Often they didn't, but even if they did, did Jesus tell us to apply a, a, a litmus test? He said, when you do this for my people, you do it for me. When you do it for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it for me. As I was saying, when Jesus calls us to care for the poor, it's an invitation to a rich and wonderful life beyond anything that this world can measure. It is an invitation to share that same grace that he gave to us. It is an invitation to serve him, to love him, and to care for him, to give him water, to give him food, to give him shelter, to visit him in sickness and in prison, to love the one who gave himself for us. To serve the poor is not a duty. It is not a burden. It is not even just an obligation. It is a blessing from our generous and loving and living Savior, Jesus Christ. My friends, have a blessed week. Bye-bye.